I'm Patricia Grabarek. And I'm Katina Sawyer. And welcome to the Worker Being Podcast. How are you doing today, Patricia? I'm doing pretty well. Um, I have jury duty this week and I'm on a jury. So that has been a very interesting and unique experience, something that I've never done before. And yeah, it's it's been a little bit tiring and not always super interesting, but um, it's something new. <laughs> How about you? I feel like on one hand, being on a jury would be cool because you could feel like you were like, I don't know, like a detective or something. And I feel like we would be really annoying on a jury because we're so used to doing stuff like this with research. We'd be like, how many people saw that is not a significant sample? Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I feel like we'd be like really like I, I feel like maybe I get a little too into it and like take it like a little. I mean, it is serious. It's a jury. But like I'd feel like I was like too into like the being like a aha like I've solved it with like whatever evidence or something so in that respect I think it could be fun but then probably it's a lot of like real boring stuff too yeah definitely a lot of boring stuff and I actually was surprised that they picked me honestly because I thought they were gonna not want me because of the psychology background because I'm like already as I'm listening to stuff I'm thinking about like the research that I know based on some of what they're talking about and I'm like well I don't agree with things because I know this research. So I feel like I'm going to go into the jury thing and people are going to hate me. They'll be like, shut up about the research. We don't care. (laughs) Um, I don't know. Maybe that's not true. Maybe it's a good thing. I don't know. But I was kind of surprised because I thought for sure they'd be like, psychology, we don't want you. Um, but I guess that's false. (laughs) You'll be like, but I'm from worker being, and this is what we do. (laughs) Don't disparage. (laughs) Don't disparage my profession, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. (laughs) Do people say, do people say ladies and gentlemen of the jury? They've, they say people of the jury. They have not said ladies and gentlemen. Because you always hear that in movies, you know, like, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I present you with, and then it's like some, like, real evidence. Or you should just scream, like, you can't handle the truth or something. (laughs) (laughs) I know that's not your role as a juror, but it would be kind of fun. (laughs) But I'm still going to do it, so obviously. Uh, (laughs) I know. It's, It's actually really interesting because it's like you're sitting there, you're supposed to be like, basically silent the entire time like you just listen you just absorb and uh and it's just kind of a weird role because like I feel like I'm so used to like chiming in and asking questions in like (laughs) real life and I'm like oh I have to just sit here and like even if I think that there's another question I want to ask this person I can't ask it I just have to let the lawyers do all the asking and I just have to sit and watch and not say a word and it's also great like the judge that we have is pretty awesome like he's funny I like him but um it's just weird to see like it happening all in front of you because like you said like oh, everything's in the movies and then you hear them saying oh you could be held in contempt of court and I was like oh, that's scary <laughs> <laughs> but like it happens I guess I don't know so it's pretty funny I'm just picturing funny. you like you're not like weighing in or saying anything or asking questions but like everything that like like you're like you know the little kid in class that like holds down their hand but really wants to ask a question or like <laughs> or like when things are happening like evidence is revealed you're just like <gasps> or like you're like fa- <laughs> fanning yourself with something to try to like <laughs> to like awake. calm down because yeah. it was so shocking <laughs> I'm just picturing you being like not like a disruptive juror but like a very like dramatic juror right now very emotive (laughs) yeah (laughs) um I think I am the I am on the low scale for that for some reason I've been able to compose myself I'm sure Um, you're not actually a dramatic juror but no there there are some jurors that like I don't know if I'd classify as dramatic but maybe you're a little bit easier to read their face uh, granted I can't look at my own face so maybe I like have <laughs> everything written all over it and I'm sitting there thinking I'm composed but <laughs> um, there are some jurors that you can tell like when they're like surprised or upset or annoyed or whatever and I'm like oh wow you have a lot of expressions on your face that's the other cool. thing that's really interesting that I've learned so like I feel like we're gonna go on this whole random sidetrack on jury duty but um I didn't know how much the judge does like 
during the day, like in terms of cases. So, you know, there's our case going on. So the trial is happening. But then like anytime there's like a break or something, there's like all these other things that are being brought to him. And so it's just like constantly like new people coming in with different like, you know, picking out dates for their trial or arraignments or whatever. And it's just like so many people and so many cases happening at once that I, it like is really impressive to look at him and be like, wow, you're kind of keeping track of where we are in this trial and where all those other cases are. Um, I'm sure he has notes and everything, but it's still just really interesting to see how much stuff is happening. Cause you know, sometimes they'll interrupt our trial. They'll do like a pause and then some, address some other case for a couple minutes and so we just sit there and like kind of watch as he's you know picking a date for the next trial or whatever um and I'm pretty I don't know I just didn't I just didn't realize like how active the courtroom is at all times yeah. even when yeah. a trial's not happening someone should study like I don't know it seems like it's a good place to study like multitasking or like I don't know how do you manage like positive emotions in one case versus negative emotions in another case or like emotional spillover from case to case? I don't know. Like that'd be kind of mm. cool, right? Yeah. I bet you there's some of that. Um, I know the judge is supposed to be like very neutral all the yeah. time. And I think he does a pretty good job, but I'm sure it's got to be hard to actually be neutral. So that's like another yeah. kind of interesting emotion study is how do you maintain neutrality? So it's not just... Um, you know, in previous episodes, we talked about like showing positive emotions at work. Yeah. And there's also the flip side of having to be negative at work, but then being neutral has got to be an interesting one, too. Yeah. Well, that could be a study. <laughs> and now we're back to being nerds. Wow. <laughs> we had a short detour towards being dramatic jurors, and now we're back to our homeostasis of being big nerds. <laughs> Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Now that we're we're back here, I want to know about the study that we're going to talk about today. Yes. So um, actually talking about judges and juries and things like that, um, my study that I'm going to be talking about today is about hope. And it's a pretty straightforward story about what hope is related to in the workplace, what hope is. Um, But more or less, uh, the reason I think it's related and Uh, or why it is related is because uh, hope is actually a construct that's studied across all different disciplines. So like philosophy, sociology, psychology, anthropology, history, like all different um, disciplines have studied hope in some respect because hope is sort of a a positive emotion that has been thought to take people through like really hard times, like having to be on trial for something. Or um, if you're, if you've been falsely accused of something, hope is what gets people through those hard times to say, well, I can hope for a different outcome. And that positive emotion can help uh, maybe eliminate some of the negativity that I'm feeling. So hope has helped people get through a lot of hard times, a lot of bad things, whether something bad has happened to you and then you have to go to court for it or something, (laughs) someone says something you did, you did was bad and you have to go to court for it, whatever. But it has been related to some of the major uh, sort of big current events uh, throughout time as well. So sort of related to our jury conversation. Interesting. Yeah, that is kind of related. So what, what's the article called? Where was it published? All those good details. Yeah. So the article is by Shori Little Snyder Cluck and Robichek. And it's called Hope and Personal Growth Initiative, a Comparison of Positive Future Oriented Constructs. So um, and it was published in the Journal of Personality and Individual Differences. Um, and so, well, the journal is just called Personality and Individual Differences, but it's the journal called Personality and Individual Differences. Um, and <laughs> it's the from year? 2007. So, um, okay. So, yeah, and Snyder, uh, one of the authors on this paper, is basically the major person in psychology that has studied hope over time. And um, there are a bunch of, like I said, different conceptualizations of what hope is across different disciplines. And even within psychology, there's a little bit of back and forth. But Snyder's uh, work on hope is probably the most popular and most widely read work on what hope is and what it relates to. Interesting. Okay, so Snyder's big name. He's he, she, I don't know is um on this publication what what is the definition of hope that yeah. Snyder is known for or that this paper is really talking about so Snyder basically in this um particular paper um it's not specific to the workplace but 
it's a foundational paper on hope. And this construct and the way it's measured has been applied to the workplace in many other articles, which is why we're using it. It's sort of a foundational piece cementing what hope is. Um, so just know it's related to workplace striving, goal achievement, things of that nature um, outside of the well-being realm as well. But the way that hope is defined is sort of these two really important pieces, which is agency and also pathways. Um, so the idea is that you have goals. Every person has goals um, in the workplace. You have goals that you want to achieve. And pathways are the ability to generate strategies to achieve your goals. So I have this goal that I want to achieve and I can think of ways that I want to achieve it. So that's the first component of hope that I'm able to actually think of a way that I can get there. And the second mm -hmm. part of hope is that I actually have the motivation that I want to try to apply those pathways to pursue my goals. So it's both the ability to think of and imagine ways that I can get to my goals and then also feel some motivation to try um, to utilize those pathways that I can think of to get where I'm going. So without both of those components, you don't have hope. So if you just can think of strategies, but you don't feel any motivation towards them, that's not the same as hope. Or if you just feel like, wow, like, I think good things are going to happen to me, but I just don't know how that'll happen. That's not hope. That's more like optimism. Um, mm -hmm. So hope is really like goal directed, uh, if that mm -hmm. makes sense, which I think is not the same way people often think about hope. They just think of it as like, oh, I hope that the weather's nice. Um, it's not that. That's more like wishing for something to happen, but it's not in your control. Hope, the way it's defined in psychology, is like I want something. I can imagine myself getting it and I'm actually going to try to do it. Okay, so that's interesting. I mean, we know and now all the listeners know that psychologists often define things a little differently than um, the average person. That's because we, well, there's a couple reasons, but one of them is we have to measure it, right? So if we want to study something, we have to be able to measure it. And to be able to measure it, that has to be something that you can actually measure. Like, right, you can talk about like that you feel hope in the general sense that we talk about hope in your day-to-day -day life, but it's a lot harder to measure. And this is a little bit easier to measure, right? You've got a very clear um, couple of things that you're looking for. So with hope, you're looking for, as you mentioned, um, having that vision and the steps to get to the, your goal and then feeling like you're able to do that and motivated to do that and you're wanting to try to get there. So those kinds of things are a little bit easier to measure than maybe the wishy-washy hope, wishing, whatever we, we talk about just generally um, in kind of everyday life. Yeah, and they're really um, careful in this research to talk about what are things that like generally we think of as hope in in the world that aren't actually aligned with what the definition of hope is. So like I mentioned optimism, like, oh, I just generally think good things happen to people or good things are going to happen to me. That's just more of an attitude about what you expect in life. But it's not like I have hope for the future that I want for myself because I can think about what that is and I understand where I'm going to try to go get after that. Um, or wishing, which is like we said, like, you know, my wedding's tomorrow and I really, really hope it doesn't rain is more like I wish it doesn't rain. There's nothing I can do to control whether or not it rains. So that's just sort of like a wish. Or if you said like, I have faith that it's not going to rain, that just means like I believe that there's some higher power that's going to keep it from raining, but that's still outside of my control. So these are all mm -hmm. kind of like different words that seem like they all mean the same thing in general language but when we talk about them and measure them in psychology they mean different things and hope is much more cognitive um, in nature it's much more about like thinking through steps in a process and feeling motivated to achieve um, the the goal itself by enacting those steps that makes sense so it's like there's a difference between somebody saying I hope to be a millionaire one day and then just say that and they hope that they do have money, right? They wish they have money in the end. Um, versus someone who says, I hope to be a millionaire one day and I'm going to do that by X, Y, Z. I'm going to, you know, go to school for this and I'm going to get this job, which is going to lead me to this job, which is going to lead me to that thing that's going to be my million dollar job. And I know how to get there because I know I should go take this class first or whatever. So 
So somebody could, in theory, say hope in both situations, but the one that we're talking about is the one that's more active and more action-oriented. Yeah. Hope versus Correct. I just want money to fall in my lap. Exactly. Um, so it's, yeah, it's different than luck or wishing or faith. Um, it's actually thinking through how do you get there and what do you want to do. So, um, and that's that's an interesting thing, I think, for people to think about because, you know, if you think about whether you're a high hoper or a low hoper, if you're a very hopeful person or not, um, it's not about wishing or optimism. It's really about to what extent do you really craft out the way that you're going to achieve your goals. And if you fail at one thing, in order to maintain your hope for your future or your hope towards that goal, you need to come up with other pathways. So it's about, you know, continuing to try different pathways to get to your goal and continuing to feel motivated like this is possible for me. I can find a way um, mm -hmm. and, and actually trying to find those ways. And the interesting thing about that is that, as you might imagine, if you're both motivated to – um, you know, go after your goal and you're able to generate strategies to go after your goal, you're more likely to attain your goal. So um, they've studied hope a lot in sports teams and uh, mm -hmm. found that in sports teams, people perform better as individuals and as a team when they have a higher level of hope uh, individually or collectively. Um, it's also related to test scores um, for students. And that's been shown through elementary school all the way up through college. Um, it's also, uh, shown to predict like school dropout rates, um, uh, both in high school and in college, uh, people with high hope are less likely to give up on school, um, and better and more likely to do better. So this idea of being able to like generate good goals, define the pathways to goals, and then be motivated to actually go after those goals actually tend to make you a better performer and you're more able to take a positive attitude when one avenue might fail, you're more likely to think of a new avenue to get to it and still maintain that, you know, that didn't work, but I'm still hopeful that I can attain this goal. Let me try something else. Okay. And that makes sense. And so then somebody on the flip side, someone that loses hope is someone that can't, they've created all these pathways as to how to get there to their goal. They're motivated to get to their goal. And then all of a sudden one thing doesn't work and they lose that motivation. So they're losing their hope along the way. Yeah. And so that would be a lower, they would call that a lower hope person. So certain people are higher in hope, which means that they just have a greater number of pathways that they'll try and they're more motivated to try a bunch of pathways. Whereas lower hope individuals are less likely to try a number of pathways and less likely to try to generate those pathways um, than higher hope people. So um, mm -hmm. you may not find out if you're a higher hope or a lower hope person until you have to try a few pathways to get to your goal. Um, the good news is that you can cultivate hopefulness in yourself by being cognizant of that and trying to grow that um, ability to continue to generate those pathways over time. So you can train yourself to be a more hopeful person if you're just cognizant of what goes into being hopeful mm -hmm. so the cognizant piece it's like you're just aware that to be hopeful I need to think of new strategies to meet my goal I need to continue to be motivated and if I'm aware of that then I'm going to continue to do that exactly and I'll think of more strategies and I'll be more, more be more motivated um, versus someone that's lower in hope that just doesn't that gives up so it's kind of almost like like to put it in layman's terms right someone that's got hope is someone that doesn't give up they're going to keep trying to find the next way to get to that goal and they're going to keep working towards it and the person that gives up that's like oh well I tried whatever and they just move on to the next thing that's a low hope person yeah exactly so um so you know basically this is something that in the workplace is really important because we face a lot of challenges at work um as I'm sure everyone listening knows that often in the workplace the first solution that we try isn't the solution that works and you have to try it multiple things and so maintaining that ability to still see um the the goal ahead of you and try to keep thinking of new ways to get there um, is really important for your performance. But what this article shows is that even over other kinds of positive attitudes, um, it still predicts more strongly to be a high hoper than some other things that are just basic positive attitudes um, with regard to your well-being. So um, psychological distress, uh, psychological well-being, um, things of that nature are positively affected by hope as well. So it's not just goal attainment, but it's also that 
you feel better about yourself and you're more well when you're a high hoper um, because not only do you get that positive feedback from the higher likelihood of goal attainment, but you also just tend to have a more you're in a more positive mode of thinking, which affects all of your attitudes as opposed to being in more downtrodden, negative way of thinking where you're sort of defeated by um, failure, initial failure after a couple repeated failures. Okay. So let's kind of break that down a little bit because I think we got a little um, complex in what you're just saying. So if I, someone that's high hope, someone that is more likely to find those pathways and to really try to meet their goals, they're more likely to feel better in terms of their wellness. Like they're going to feel happier. They're going to be, um, just, just overall their wellness will be higher, right? Yes. Well-being will be, they'll be well people. Yep. Those people that don't have that hope that are more likely to give up are going to feel worse about that. They're worse about themselves, worse about their situation. They're not going to feel um, that same level of wellness as someone that's high hope. And so what you're saying is that someone that's high hope, they're more likely to reach their goals. So that's part of it. They reach their goals. So they're going to feel good, obviously, because they reached, they, they got to where they wanted to be. Um, so that's one component. But the other piece is just being hopeful. That makes you feel better. So even if you don't get to that goal yet, you the fact that you feel like you can is what's helping you feel better and someone that's low hope might be less likely to get to their goal and they're also obviously less hopeful so they're not really seeing how they could get to that goal they're not necessarily motivated to try to get to that goal and that all kind of impacts their wellness to be poor is that kind of accurate Yep, that's correct. Um, so uh, it's basically the idea that, as you said, you know, um, if I am in this positive state of striving towards um, goals that I care about, um, and even regardless of whether or not I've achieved all of those goals yet, being in that positive mental state is good for me psychologically. And so even compared to other positive psychological states, it appears that there's something about hope um, that really makes people even more well um, and even less psychologically distressed uh, because it's this combination of achievement and generating new ways of achieving goals as well as like that motivation to move along that path. So it's not just like um, it's more of an empowered kind of positivity than just like oh gee I hope good things happen to me or I think good things are going to happen to me but it's this empowered feeling of like I I think that they will and this is how I'm going to do it mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense I think there's a lot around um I mean just kind of in everyday life when you think about empowerment you think about the positivity of that right so if you feel empowered to achieve your goals right in the sense that you know how you're going to get there and you um, are motivated to try, then yeah, that's obviously going to be related to being just generally in a more positive place. Because if you are just focusing on luck, so like your positivity is, oh, I, you know, wish that I get to become a VP of this company one day and that's it. Um, when it doesn't happen, you don't, you might feel a little defeated, but it's not like related to you and you're just kind of like move on with your life. And it just, I don't know. It's like a very like, um, I think I'm not expressing this well, but it's a very kind of backseat approach yeah. to your life and what's happening. And you don't, when you, people don't feel like they have control, um, they're just less happy and less healthy overall. I mean, we talk about that with other things in the workplace, like um, autonomy, right? Or job control, where you're able to actually control what you're doing day to day in your job. You know, that you have some broader goals to accomplish for your your role but you aren't told like you know when you first wake up you have to do this 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 you're not given the strict timeline you can kind of build your own timeline you have that flexibility those people are happier those people are healthier um and it, it seems like hope is similar it's when you feel like you have control because if you have hope you have control you see yourself as an as a person with control to achieve your goals um and you're going to be happier and healthier too yeah, and I think it might be good for um, just to go through some of the um, items that are um, in the hope scale just to get a sense of, you know, what what the uh, actual questions are that people are being asked. Um, so items that are indicative of 
higher hope are things like um, I've been pretty successful in life. I'm able to meet the goals I set for myself. Um, I can think of many ways to get to the things in life that are important to me. There are lots of ways around any problem. Even when others get discouraged, I usually know I can find a way to solve a problem. So um, if you're thinking to yourself as you're listening to those items, like, yes, that's how I feel in my life, then you might be a high hoper. Um, If you're a person who feels like I'm able to come up with solutions to solve problems, I think that any problem I face, there's a way around it. Um, And, you know, I pretty much uh, have action plans uh, that may allow me to meet the goals that I set for myself. I've been pretty successful in in being able to achieve my goals, things of that nature. Um, Then you're more likely to be motivated to do that and also to actually achieve them. So those are some of the items that that also helps to better explain what hope is. Yeah. No, I like this. I think this is really interesting. I'd be curious to see maybe in a different episode, we can kind of revisit this hope idea and like talk more about um, how it actually applies to the workplace in addition to what we just talked about with well-being because I think it's a very interesting idea, very interesting concept. And I think um, today we've really done a good job of, hopefully a good job of explaining what it is. And I think that's huge because it's so different than just your average approach to hope and what you think it is. Uh, and I think it's huge that it also impacts your wellness so I would love to to hear more in the future for me on this topic because I think it's just really interesting because it makes sense that hope would have a big impact. I would just like to hear more. Yeah, I've been reading a lot about it lately, which is what led me to pick this article. Um, and so, you know, as I mentioned before, in this particular article, it picks this one uh, other kind of positive way of thinking about yourself, with it, which is positive growth initiative, which is this idea that if I need to make a change in my life, I'm good at tackling life changes, basically. Um, and what they found is even if you think you're a person that's good at anticipating changes, it's not exactly the same as being a person that says like incrementally over time, I'm constantly trying to think about achieving problems achieving goals by problem solving so it's not just that like a problem or like something major happens in my life and I feel like oh now I'm good at like redirecting things but rather like on a daily basis even when tiny things pop up that uh, I consider to be a challenge I'm able to navigate those and come up with problem solving Um, So even compared to other things that seem a little bit similar, uh, but might be uh, more like one time or two time only in a lifetime, lifetime, because hope is this like daily basis kind of thing, this daily basis kind of mentality, it is more related to um, positive outcomes than that kind of uh, an orientation like personal growth initiative or other kinds of positive um, constructs that are similar in nature. So um, it predicts more strongly whether or not you'll have positive attitudes towards life, whether you'll feel psychological distress, or whether you'll be generally like psychologically well um, in terms of your mental health. Um, So those things overall are more strongly predicted by hope than other kinds of things. So basically the take home point there is if you want to really focus on growing something in yourself or if you're already naturally this way, um, hope is a really good thing to try to cultivate because it seems to be strongly related to well-being but also to performance, um, which is really helpful in the workplace. So if you already are that way, awesome. Um, If you can grow that in yourself um, or at least be conscious of whether or not you're doing that and try to uh, facilitate some of that kind of thinking, um, I think that, you know, what the research shows is that that's really helpful. So it sounds like with hope, just based on the types of items you were reading, to, for me, if I'm low in hope, what I need to do is I need to be aware of that. Notice, okay, you know, I'm actually not doing these things. I'm not finding ways around problems. And then say to myself, I want to get this next promotion and... I know that I need to, you know, work on more projects like this to get there. And then let's say one of my projects falls through. Now what can I do? And so I need to be able to notice, okay, instead of giving up right here, I need to think of what's my next path to get what I need to get to my promotion. So I need to be aware and I need to be focusing on adjusting my behavior so that I can be more hopeful. Yeah. Yes. Um, And, you know, thinking about, even getting like a notebook where you can write down like 
these are six different ways that I might achieve my goal. Like first, I'm going to try this. If that doesn't work, I'm going to try that. If that doesn't work, I'm going to try that. So try to just build things in to make it easier for you to already have an action plan in place. When something fails, what are you going to do next? So it's sort of like pre-planning um, to make sure that you have mm -hmm. a wide array of options of ways to achieve your goal. And you can even tweak some of them along the way. But just so that, you know, if there's something that happens to you mentally where that first challenge is overwhelming you've already thought about and mapped out some of those other pathways um, and now it's just about like mustering the energy to go try that other pathway um, but but you know you've already done some of the hard work of premeditating what plan a b c d e f might be that makes sense that makes sense is there anything in the research that you've read I know probably not in this study but in other research around how you can build your hope yeah it's mostly just uh, training yourself to think more broadly about solving problems. So um, not putting all your eggs in one basket. So like, I have this problem. This is how I'm going to solve it. And not anticipating like, okay, if that doesn't work, what else can I do? So it's a lot about anticipating failure um, and accepting failure and then saying, you know, OK, I might be upset that that didn't work, but let's move on to the next solution quickly um, to keep that motivation up. So you're constantly in a, in a state of striving towards goals um, mm -hmm. and uh, you're not allowing those failures to get you down. So I think it's really about, um, you know, pre-planning the pathways uh, as much as possible and then really reminding yourself of the importance of the goal so that when you face failure, which is difficult for anybody, that you can re-energize yourself around that goal. That makes sense. So um, trying to think of an example that we can kind of do just an easy example of what it might look like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's say I want to get a raise um, and I'm really focused on getting a raise. And so um, my first, you know, uh, line of defense is to set up a meeting with my manager to ask for a raise. So I do that and I use the best arguments that I possibly can to ask for the raise. And my manager says at this time, you know, I don't think it's possible for us to give you a raise. So let's say phase two of that is to say, OK, let me see if there's further information that I might be able to gather that I didn't think of the first time around. Or let me talk to other people I know that have gotten raises to see what they did so I can learn from their experience and go in and see if I might be able to, uh, you know, have a second meeting and try to make another um, you know, uh, sort of argument for why I should get the raise. If that doesn't work, maybe I can say, okay, well, uh, in the meeting, if the person says I still can't have a raise, maybe I can set a date where we can revisit the raise. Um, so, and then I can plan for that meeting. So like I'm constantly moving towards the goal. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm sort of saying, okay, well, Maybe it can't happen right now, but if I can get another meeting on the books to reconsider it six months from now, um, I'll still be motivated towards that goal. It may not be exactly the goal that I had set or the exact timing that I set, but I'm not going to give up on the idea of actually getting that raise or achieving that goal. And I think it goes along with like a lot of the stuff that you hear about people who are writers or very famous musicians or actors or actresses or fields that are really hard to get into because they're so saturated and so few people are successful that one of the things that people will say is that it's about going on hundreds of different auditions and facing tons and tons of rejection until you get that one shot or it's about you know submitting your book to a hundred different agents and hearing 99 no's until you get that one yes so it does seem like um, in achieving really lofty goals people who tend to be the folks that are more likely to achieve them are the ones that, you know, kept going up, down, around the system to try to figure out a way to get themselves through. So as you're saying all of that, it makes me think that hope, I mean, we've talked about it. We just haven't said the word persistence, but hope has to do with persistence. Yeah. Like you are going to continue to pursue that goal. You're still motivated to pursue that goal and you're finding ways to get that to that goal. So you're being persistent with your goal and you believe you can get there. That's part of it really but the persistence piece is is a big component too yeah absolutely um that you're uh continually motivated uh toward uh you know trying new ways to get there um regardless of the circumstances and you know that's why a lot of um 
it's it's really interesting but a lot of the hope work has been done not in the psychology literature as much but more broadly um in populations where you know in like people that have been retroactively interviewed about um, their experiences in the Holocaust, for example, um, things of that nature where people say, well, you know, I always imagined myself surviving. And so on one day, if I had a really bad day and this is the plan that I had for myself and things went wrong, I thought, well, maybe I'm not going to get out that way. But here's another way that I can imagine myself getting out. Or maybe, you know, things didn't go in a good way today. But here's how I imagine tomorrow, if the same thing were to happen to me today, I could come up with something to make things a little bit better for myself or whatever the case may be. So um, this idea that, you know, even just incrementally moving closer to your goal little by little, even if it's something extremely dire, um, actually help to keep people healthier and more able to survive even under extreme conditions because they were in a mentality of every day I get a little bit closer. And even if today is a wash, tomorrow I can get a little bit closer than I did today. That's really interesting. Well, I'm sure that research is so interesting. The yeah. Holocaust research. Fascinating, of course. Um, and luckily much darker than what we're dealing with when we're setting hope today. So hopefully there's, uh, some hope that you can take from the fact that your situation is not that bad. Um, (laughs) yes, but yeah, that's, that's so interesting. It does. It makes sense though. It makes sense that if you have this, this outlook that you can do something, that you have some control to get yourself to where you need to be that you're going to be more positive and you're going to feel better about things. So I think, I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, me too. So if you're out there and you're listening, um, I hope that you try to grow your hope. (laughs) I had to say it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, I think it's a good exercise for people to do and it keeps you in, uh, a growth mindset and a positive mindset in a way that, um, seems to be unique uh even from just being a person that has a good attitude towards life um so try to grow your hope and think of different pathways to achieve your goals and um and write them down and don't let failure kind of discourage you from moving on to path number two um continue on that motivational path towards achieving your goal you'll be more likely to get there and you'll be healthier along the way because you um you know, continued to find a way to make progress even when things seemed hard. That's great tips. <laughs> great takeaways. <laughs> and I'm definitely going to try to do that myself. I think that generally I'm probably on the high hope scale, mm-hmm. but I know that there are certain situations that get me down. So I'm going to try to take everything we learned today to apply uh, myself when I am feeling discouraged about a goal and, and help myself get hopeful again. Me too. I'm so Yay. hopeful that we're hopeful and I'm hoping that everyone else <laughs> is hoping that they can be hopeful too, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> it's just made me think of, uh, we could talk about this later, about other research. Like I want to know about hope and entrepreneurs. It's a good idea. I haven't seen anything on that. Yeah. I feel like that's got to be, because I was just thinking about our goals and like yeah. being hopeful and obviously here we are doing worker being stuff and We clearly have goals for worker being and we're pursuing it and we're running with it. And I wonder if hope has a big piece with entrepreneurship. Yeah, that's a really good point. Side note for something else. No, that's good. (laughs) I'd be curious about that too. And I haven't seen anything on that. So maybe we can look it up and see if we want to do it for a future um, uh, post or a future podcast. But, uh, But and if there's nothing on it, maybe we can see someday what we might come up with. Yeah, good. All right, cool. Well, for all those listeners, thank you so much for listening. And we'd love to hear from you. Uh, Reach out. Let us know if you're hopeful. If you're not, how do you help yourself be more hopeful? Um, We would love to hear your thoughts on the topic. You can reach out to us on our website, which is workerbeing.com. You can email us at workerbeing at gmail.com. And you can reach us on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram at workerbeing. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. The Worker Being Podcast is hosted by us, Patricia Grabar and Katina Sawyer, and produced by Allie Johnson. Mm-hmm.